G'day everybody, where's Wally here? Well today this one's gonna be huge. And by that I mean I got a flatty who's gonna say some dumb stuff. I'm gonna say some science stuff. Another flatty is gonna say some dumb stuff. And I'm gonna follow that up with some more science just to show where he was totally wrong again. Hold on to your hats, this one's gonna take a little bit. We've never seen any, uh, there has never been any, um, any observation where it was possible to have a gas or atmosphere next to an empty space or worse again a vacuum empty space or a vacuum which is it which sucks the baddest uh, uh i haven't really given that one a much thought uh on the left here is a new type of uh aerosol can this is the traditional one here where you push down on here and it creates a vacuum which pulls up and out the uh spray now, they're both pressurized, but this one here is, it's, when you press down, you're pumping air underneath, which, pu which pushes uh, this up and pushes out, the, uh, out through the nozzle, the uh, liquid or whatever. How is it possible that Brian got both wrong? Uh, uh, I haven't really given that one a much thought. Uh, uh, I haven't really given that one a much thought. Any, the only explain the only exact, the only, there's no, but there's no better explanation for gravity than dropping something out of your hand and leaving it hit the floor. But that can be explained with, with density as well. Right? That, all these things can be explained with density and buoyancy for majority of them. Now, I'm not saying everything can be explained with that. Right? I, 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 but like, let's be honest, if you can't prove gravity, then if there is any kind of a force pushing down the way, any kind of a downward force, uh, 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 then how do you know that it is what you would call gravity? Have you ever thought that maybe it may not be what you think it is? So there you have it. Ryan has stuffed up yet again. He's forgotten that he's supposed to be denying the existence of a downwards force. The name of that force doesn't matter. You can call it Earthsuck or Bruce. Matters not. But the existence of any downward force is all that's needed to have a pressure gradient. And once you admit that there is a pressure gradient, then you have to admit that at the top of that pressure gradient is going to be zero, a vacuum. I mean, sorry, empty space right at the top of that gradient. Whoopsies. Uh, uh, I haven't really given that one a much thought. Now, if you can imagine our atmosphere, we have a huge amount of different gases and whatever, and obviously oxygen is, is, a, is made up of a couple of gases. Uh, and you have a huge amount of water. Wow, oxygen in the atmosphere. Well... Oxygen in the atmosphere is a diatomic molecule. That means two atoms, just like nitrogen. Just like carbon dioxide isn't. Uh, uh, I haven't really given that one a much thought. Okay, if you were going by what science would say about space and all the rest of it, it would have a massive vacuum, minus 10 to, minus 10 to the 17 vacuum. It would be, it would be, you, it would be a horrendous. That we would be dead in no, I don't even think we would last we wouldn't last even five seconds. The whole thing, the whole place, as far as I can tell, would be just dead. Five seconds is all it would take. One by ten to the negative seventeen tour. Well, Brian thinks you would not survive five seconds in that massive vacuum of space. Uh, uh, I haven't really given that one a much thought. Nothing can live in a vacuum. Uh, and uh, if you have a vacuum of that power, there is not a hope. So if a, if a gas will fill an empty space without a vacuum, right, what will it do with the most powerful vacuum you could possibly even imagine. It's just, you know, it, it's not possible. Wow, I was thinking Brian was just using empty space and vacuum interchangeably, but no, he seems to think that these are two different things. Well, I do hope he isn't just thinking that zero PSI is empty space and that a vacuum is the negative pressure. He isn't, is he? Uh, uh, I haven't really given that one a much thought. The weight of it is pulling it down. All that dampness is pulling down the oxygen There's down here to the bottom. That's why we can only see a certain amount of distance out in front of us. If you stand on a beach at the clearest day you can find, you'll still only be able to see a few miles out to sea. There will be a point when the horizon, uh, due to atmosphere, will meet the sea, or will meet the, the horizon, uh, the, sorry, the land and sea will meet the, the sky. Because uh, you can only see so far in a straight line. You can only see a certain distance at sea level. Really, Brian? 
Well, we thought the sun was like thousands of miles away, and you can see that at sea level. Uh, uh, I haven't really given that one a much thought, because I have a lot of things I'm thinking about with it. It's just something my video needed to make before I talked myself out of it or before I decided not to. I said I just needed to make this. Mate, you really should have listened to your other personality and not made this video at all. It has not gone well for you. Uh, uh, I haven't really given that one a much thought. But if we're inside a pressurised system, which we are, and there's a pressure gradient, I think my explanation for of what I'm giving here is far more logical than anything science is coming up with. Well, enough of Brian being silly, and he's just launched me into my next subject here. Cooling. And more specifically, cooling in space. I mean, it always amazes me that flatties constantly jump on the old bubbles in space to try and debunk the ISS and space and so forth, but they always fail to think about the much greater issues. So I've been waiting for flatties to come up with this problem for a long time, yeah? Think of a spacesuit sitting in space. Okay, it's like sitting in a car in a desert in the middle of summer with the AC off. And you've got the perfect insulator the vacuum of space wrapped all around you. So if you think back to your physics classes, not that any of you probably went to physics class, there's only three ways you can cool an object. Radiation, convection, conduction. And two of those are out of order because there is no air to do it. So all you got is radiation. And it can't radiate the heat away from you as fast as the heat is coming in from that great big thermonuclear reaction over there we call the sun. So, none of those are going to work. How are you going to cool this suit? Well, now that you realise you're going to roast in just a few minutes, how do you think the space suit stays cool? Well, the suit is white, so that helps it stop absorbing a little bit, and helps it re-radiate a little bit as well. A space suit is called by a super simple piece of kit called a heat rejection porous plate sublimator. Got my mouth around that one. And this is exactly the same bit of kit that they used on the Apollo capsules and on the lunar landers and on the spacesuits that walked on the moon. Well, how does it work? I'm about to drop some knowledge on you. Well, think about a wet t-shirt for a second. And why is it that we know that this is cold? Yes, we can see it's cold. Okay, you got that thought? Well, evaporation. So the water phase changing from liquid to the vapour sucks up heat to do that phase change. Well, water sublimating going from solid through liquid to vapour sucks up even more, it's a double phase change. So what the suit has is a water loop, it runs all around the astronaut to their extremities all over their body to keep them cool. Then that warm water on the return side is then run through the heat rejection porous plate sublimator to cool it again. And what is this magic heat rejection porous plate sublimator I hear you ask? Well it's a plate of sintered metal, it allows the liquid water to pass through it. And it has the vacuum on the outside and the 5 psi of O2 pressure on the inside. So the water is pushed through this plate. The water's not sucked through the plate by the vacuum, wake up to yourself. It's pushed through the plate by the pressure inside the suit. But once it hits the vacuum, it evaporates, it cools, it freezes, and it seals the plate. And of course, as some of that water disappears, more water flows in behind it. And it keeps the plate really, really cold. So on the inside of the heat rejecting porous plate sublimator is a sheet of ice and the water runs over that. Very simple isn't it? So it keeps sublimating and keeps cooling the plate. The liquid then can be cooled on the inside and the metal conducts the heat to the ice and some of that ice sublimates. And it stays sealed and any water passing through the plate freezes almost instantly. But now when it's first turned on, the plate is warm, the water is warm, and it passes easily through the plate. There's bits of bit of water over the inside of the airlock. And this is the source of the bubbles that we often see Flat is referring to during the initial stages of a spacewalk. It's just water ice spitting out of the, wait for it, heat rejecting porous plate sublimator. So how good is that? How good a cooler is it? Well, it's about 2000 BTU. That's about 600 watts, or similar to a very small room AC unit. And all that is just to cool one spacesuit. Quite easy, hey? Ready? Barely an inconvenience. Okay, well that's enough science for me for the minute. We'll get back into it a bit more shortly. Now let's go to the D Marbles Institute and learn some more, shall we say, science from him? Take it away, D. Says an astronaut plugged the leak on the space station with his finger. 
The ISS astronauts later used tape and gauze to seal the hole more permanently. I find this to be a little bit ridiculous because, um, you know, from what we've been told, let me see, uh, there are some strong, serious issues in dealing with holes in, um, <laughs> says a corny line. She's like, oh, this sucks on so many levels. I'm like, that was the corniest line in a movie I've ever seen. But, but anyway, she says that, and then she gets sucked out into the hole, out into the vacuum of space through this little small hole. And she got shredded going through this screen because now there was a screen on top of the hole and she gets sucked out through that. And you see little entrails and all that terrible. But that was an example in the movies of what they what were told would happen when somebody is um, subjected to the vacuum of space. Whenever there's a hole, there's the vacuum, there's the pressurized cabin. Air is going to be rushing out, period. Uh, look there's not going to be any sticking a finger in the hole and that's just going to be cool. In theory, dude would have stuck his, from what we've been told in these movies, uh, dude would have stuck his finger in the hole and like his whole arm would have got sucked through and his shoulder. I mean, it, it would have went crazy, but. Okay. So D marbles, your turn. Well, firstly, you were using a movie over science. That's strike one. I mean, movies, they take creative license with the plot, you know, and the science. That's what makes them interesting. They twist things a little bit. It's all up to the writers to just try and make a storyline interesting. Secondly, you said the hole in the hull was two millimeters. Okay, close. And that in the movies, the hole was the size of a fist, you say. So let's say 100 millimeters. Now, you're not even comparing like for like. So that's strike two. Let's do some science on that. Look, you know that the pressure of one atmosphere is 14.7 PSI, right? P-S-I. Well, let's see what happens if you actually do the maths. And you cannot argue with the maths. Let's have a look at this. Oh, I've got a spreadsheet. How about that? So a two millimeter hole, that gives you an area of 3.1415 millimeters. And that at a pressure of 14.7 PSI, that gives you about... 32 grams a millimeter on that whole sized area, which is about the weight of three AAA batteries, so barely an inconvenience. Well, and if you have a look at the fist, that was like 100 millimeters, so that's about two and a half thousand times bigger, which is about 80 kilograms of weight, you know, about one D marble wet. So, yeah, that would kind of hurt if you had a 100 millimeter hole under your hand and someone about the weight of a D marbles was standing on it. But let's see what happens if you have a 300 millimeter hole. So that's going to be up around 727, 728 kilograms, which is about the weight of a small car on about a one foot diameter hole. Ooh, yes, you might get spaghettified and shoved through that. So the marbles, you see what's going on here? The effect is only for a large hole. For a small hole, too easy. What's up, Wally? This, this, this isn't a movie and NASA's full of crap anyway. And that ISS, well, that's been debunked so many times with the... Um, with the harnesses, the wires, the CGI glitches, the C G I. What's up, Wally? Why wasn't he able to do it live? Oh, that's right, because the blue checkered uh, CGI screen wasn't there to make that whole graphic continue. Okay, got it. That's exactly why that happened. Hey, D, just so you know, that blue screen you refer to is actually an educational aid. It's actually available online and you can buy one. And so far as the claim of a green screen or chroma key to be more correct, white lines are a real no-no. Just ask anyone who plays with Zoom. What's up, Wally? Okay, so that's enough of D-Marbles. Let's go and do some more science. Okay, I've got a question for the astute listener. You find yourself having listened to the third anthology of Vogon poetry. The guard grabs you and drags you off down the hallway with your compatriot. You're tossed into the airlock. What do you do? Well, quite simple, really. You breathe out and take your pants off. And if you want to know why, stay listening. Would you like a hug? No. Space, says the introduction to the Hitchhiker's Guide, is big really big. You just won't believe how vastly, hugely, mind-bogglingly big it is. 
uh, and so on. Okay, so from my extensive study using the at least these three videos in the link below, and they are really excellent ones on this subject, I have determined that what will happen is you will suffer a Mentos in Coca-Cola effect from both ends of the alimentary canal at the moment you hit the vacuum of space, and that's hence why you need to get your pants down real quick, and of course breathe out because the air is going to disappear out your lungs real quick too. So it seems like you've got like 15 seconds before you pass out, so you've got to hurry up with all of those things. And from the research on some of these poor doggies and chimps and whatever else, there's a couple of accidents that have happened, it seems like you've got somewhere between about 90 seconds and 3 minutes to be repressurized. And if you are, apart from a few broken capillaries in your eyes and a few space hickeys, you're probably going to be pretty much okay. And just check out this moon image that um, Bad Astronomer Full Plate tweeted just before. And I'm just adding this because this is absolutely glorious and beautiful. And flatties have absolutely no idea how to explain this sort of prettiness. Okay, well, that's probably it. We've gotten ourselves. So I think all that's needed now is for the snark to take it away and sing us out as we watch some Russians. The day the flat earth died. Bye bye, now there's no more that guy. Took a whale's wally, then he ran off to cry. He tried to prove flat earth, but got a poke in the eye. Sobbing, I watched the flat earth die. I watched the flat earth just die. The day the flat earth died Bye bye now there's no mother guy Took a whale's wally then he ran up to cry Tried to prove a flat earth but got a poke in the eye Sobbing I watched the flat earth die I watched the flat earth just die oh.